Book Talk begins at 9 minutes and 8 seconds. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 660, The Frankie Doth Protest Too Much. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by our lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash craftlit and our members on the YouTube Craftlit channel membership. This week, we would like to highlight Tina Jackson, Elizabeth Gardner, Deborah Jackson Weiss, Jeff Eisenhower, and Maria V. Thank you so much for your support. It brings me no end of joy to be able to bring this to you because of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pretty good. It hasn't been a great week the last week, but I'm I'm doing better than fair to middling today. And since I'm recording this on a Monday, I like to think that that means that the rest of this week is going to be good. Let's just keep that in the sights. Things to know if you are new to listening to Craftlet, Emma, the current book begins with episode 649. So that will make it easier for you to find if you want to go back and start at the beginning of Emma. Raffle, the June raffle prize is, as mentioned last time, the author clock, Everyone Has a Story, volume one, which still cracks me up that it's called volume one. This was a Kickstarter. Andrew accidentally got two of these. They're adorable. It's a pretty sturdy clock, but instead of having a clock face, it gives you every three minutes it changes to have different quotes on screen from literature all over the time and space continuum of literature itself. Anytime specific actual times like 921 is mentioned in a book, somebody is pulled 921 and they they show that as a quotation. They show you that that chunk of text as a quotation on the screen, which is really kind of fun. And I've learned about some very funny books because of that. So I love it. All you have to do to enter this raffle is go into the description or the show notes and click on the link that takes you to the widget. The widget has you share Craftlet or do something like that. And that's it. It doesn't cost you any money or anything like that. It's just a few minutes of time. And then that serves as your entry. And you can do more than one thing. Like if you really, 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 really want the author clock, enter as many times as you can figure out stuff to do. And then a random generator selects the winner at the end of the month. So that will be the end of June. We will announce the winner of the author clock. I get an unreasonably big kick out of watching the screen change on this little clock. I don't know what that says about me, but I hope it says the same thing about you. (laughs) But I'm not alone. Oh, our book month for patrons at the junior tier and above. We are reading The Big Sleep for this month by Raymond Chandler. I think it's the first Philip Marlowe crime story. It's very interesting. I've been doing a little research. They don't really like to call his books detective fiction, even though Philip Marlowe is indeed a detective. They call them crime fiction. And there's some theorizing that one of the interesting things about The Big Sleep is that the mystery part is solved like around the middle of the book. There ain't no mystery anymore. Everybody's done. Everybody's satisfied. Everybody gets paid. It's over. Except Marlo knows that he hasn't gotten to the bottom of it, that there is something else that needs to be dealt with or solved. And that's why they call it crime fiction. The good private eye going above and beyond. Philip Marlo is definitely being set up to be a chivalrous character in all possible ways. So him really taking it seriously, like, I know I'm not getting paid anymore, but I have to figure this out and make sure that all the wrongs are righted, that everything that needs to be redressed has been redressed. That actually may have started with with Philip Marlowe and good old Raymond Chandler, who's a bit of a snob, but in ways that we would like. So 
that's just fine. Our book party will be Thursday, June 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is when we will have our, our book party. That will happen on Discord if you are on Patreon or the YouTube channel membership and you are at the Jane Eyre level or above and you are not yet on Discord. Please email me, heather at craftlit.com or eric, E R I K, at craftlit.com, and one of us will help you get up onto Discord. It really is not as difficult as one would think. And the thing that I love about Discord is its notifications are permanent. So, unlike everywhere else on the internet, if you try and get a hold of me on Discord, I will actually see that you have tried to get a hold of me on Discord and it will stay on my phone screen until. I dismiss it. It's better than even text messaging me in that respect. You can get me much faster on Discord than anywhere else if you if you suddenly find that you really, really, really need me. So there's that. Last week, I think it was at the end of the episode, I read you an email question sent in by Mareta. I think I'm remembering her name right. You guys need to tell me if you have a name that isn't like boring American. Please, if I am mispronouncing it, especially if you're a patron or a, a member over at our YouTube channel, please let me know so that I don't keep screwing it up for you over and over and over again. I will only feel bad if I find out that you've been suffering through me massacring your name for a long period of time before you finally reached out to correct me. So just give me a phonetic heads up and I will, I will fix that. But last week, the question was, what's the difference between a gentleman farmer and a tenant farmer? And Tammy who listens over on YouTube and always leaves the nicest comments and asks questions over on YouTube comments. She wrote in and said, probably the reason why rencontre, the French, and I said snooty, kind of snooty way of saying re-encounter, she actually gave me a better contextual read on that word. She said she is always used slash heard rencontre being used more as investigative, like Mr. Elton didn't just happen to be reacquainted with his now wife-to-be. He kind of went out of his way to get a hold of her again, to meet up with her again. And that makes a lot more sense to me. It is also, I think we can say with Elton, the use of the French was not also accidental, but I do like knowing that there is that kind of word charge, the investigative side of things when, when using that word. So I thought that was good. And then Tammy also solved our question about tenant farmers versus gentleman farmers and said that the way that she had always thought of it was a gentleman farmer is in business for himself. So he may not own the land, but he has made enough money or he has enough money to be able to rent the land as a renter and run his life as a small businessman. Whereas a tenant farmer is more of an employee of the person who owns the property. And it's subtle, but that does make sense. And in fact, it's going to matter in today's two chapters. We're going to do chapter 24 and 25 or volume two, chapter six and seven today. And in both of these, class and the rules around class structure matter enormously. So Tammy, thank you. That could not have come at a better time for us. Thank you. I really, really appreciate you guys stepping up while my brain is not 100%. I mean, I've always known how smart y'all are, so it's just nice when you step in and help me out like that. I appreciate it. <laughs> so along with it having a lot to do with all of the possible layers, multi-layered importance of class and class structure and class expectations, I called this week's episode The Frankie Doth Protest Too Much, an obvious callback to Hamlet. Hamlet's mother, Gertrude, the lady doth protest too much. It's like, she's making too big a deal of saying, no, 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 that didn't happen. That didn't happen at all. Why? Why would you say that? I can't imagine that you'd say that that mother. When in fact, she's just nervously covering up for the thing she didn't want you to know she did. Frank Churchill figures, not surprisingly, in these two chapters. And there are points where, keep your ears open, for him just being a little too a little too, too, too much, too cautious in the way that he approaches certain topics or, or kind of circumnavigates around certain topics. Just keep your ears open for that. Because, Frank, 
it's going to take a while for this to pay off, but the groundwork of what's going to happen in volume three is all starting to be laid right here, right now. So, Frank, other things to know for today's chapter. There is, going along with what I just said, a reference to gentlemen and half gentlemen in town in Highbury. And this is this is not a, a slight like, oh, it's a half gentleman. He's not really a gentleman. It's like, no, these are people who fiscally, financially, societally have earned a position in society, but for whatever reason, they aren't landed gentry. They aren't nobility. They aren't hereditarily part of the gentleman class. It's the first time that I can remember coming across that as a moniker, as a, a term of art for describing people's levels in society. So I thought that was kind of cool. I also learned this, windows. I think we've talked before about how in New York City, and I believe it was true in London, at least for a while, if you had a closet in your apartment slash home, like Brooklyn Brownstone style home, if you had a closet, it got counted as a room, which is why you find a lot of old New York City apartments don't have closets. Everybody had armoires if they were lucky or, you know, trunks, boxes, things like that. I've known that for a long time. What I didn't know was that in England, between 1696 and 1851, there was a window tax. So there's a scene, if you remember back in Pride and Prejudice, there is a scene where Mr. Collins is going over and the word is enumerating the windows on the front of Lady de Bourgh's house. That is not just, look at the great glasswork, kids. That is, that's a lot of money. So in today's chapter, you're going to hear Frank referred to as paying close attention to, or at least being appropriately impressed by two big windows and a place in Highbury. So now you know that that was, ah, well, there's enough money in Highbury to at least make sure that this place can afford that level of architectural finessing, which I thought was kind of cool. Don't forget timing, the timing of appointments, not appointments like doctor's appointments, but when you go to call on somebody as a polite interaction, exchange of time with somebody. We said last week, 15 minutes was really the bare minimum for anything other than a really perfunctory visit. And that's why it mattered that Emma picked Harriet up at 14 minutes. Today, you're going to hear Frank referring to the same kinds of rules about how long one should expect. Pay attention to how big a deal he makes about the different levels of timing. Again, this is, like I said, groundwork that is going to pay off down the road a ways, but pay attention to it now. Frank also makes a comment at one point when they go to Ford's in Highbury. Ford's is kind of the general store. He wants to go and buy gloves. And he says he wants to be taking his freedom, taking out his freedom, proving that he is a member of Highbury's, not society in the capital S way, but the lowercase s, part of the fabric of Highbury. He won't feel completely right about unless he goes and purchases something at Ford's, which is kind of sweet. But then they talk about gloves. And even though he says he's looking for gloves, Emma says that they're bringing down well-tied parcels of men's beavers, which I thought were hats. I don't know if anybody's heard of beaver skin or beaver fur gloves. I imagine if you're going to make a beaver fur hat, you could make beaver fur mittens or gloves. But it sounds to me like they're still referring to hats, even though the follow-up to that, there's beavers and York tans. York tans were tan-colored leather gloves or men's gloves that were, I know you're going to be shocked, made in York. So that's what that is referring to. Do let me know if you know of beaver fur gloves as well. Like I said, that seems that seemed kind of tricky to make. Mittens, sure, but gloves, I don't know. But you can either email me, heather at craftlit.com, or call 206-350-1642, or you can go to linktr.ee slash craftlit channel. And from there, you will get a link to both the phone number and also the SpeakPipe. SpeakPipe is the way you can leave us a message without having to spend money on long distance charges if you are out of the country. So there. Amour Patrie. 
is love of one's country. Frank will use that term as well. And in this case, he's not using country as in UK. He's using country as in his countryside, his town, his Highbury. Be prepared to listen to Emma miscue things again when it comes to Jane Fairfax. Remember, she thought that the way Jane was behaving implied that the Campbells, the family who she'd been staying with, that her daughter's now husband, Mr. Dixon, was really having the hots for Jane and vice versa. Emma's going to continue working under this incorrect assumption. And you'll notice that she is truly the only one who is thinking this way. Everybody else, not so much. At the end of our first chapter, there's a note about somebody having enough wealth to be allowed an early establishment. This means an early establishment of a household. Like you, you get your home, you have your staff, you have all of those things set in place. That's an early establishment would mean getting married young and being able to set that stuff up right away. Chapter 25. So this is volume two, chapter seven. You're going to hear a reference to going to London to getting a haircut. The short version is, of course, they had people in Highbury who could cut your hair. That's the first thing you need to know. The second thing is wigs were no longer really in fashion, certainly not for young men. And so haircuts had become a necessity if you didn't have someone at home who could cut your hair for you, someone on your staff. Jane Austen also uses the phrase a sudden freak, which is really just a sudden whim, like out of the blue, he kind of, he freaks out and does this thing, except it's not really freaking out. It's just a freak occurrence. Like, wow, really? That's what you decided to do with your time? Okay. In order to get this haircut, he calls for a, or he sends for a chaise. So a chaise is... We've talked about these before. It's a smaller carriage. It can hold up to about three people. And this is something that you could hire. And you actually hear quite a bit about where horses were kept in Highbury and what kind of system they had. Because if you were riding post from one end of England to another, you would have to switch out your horse if you weren't going to stop at an inn and let your horse rest. You were going to have to do post horses where basically you leave your horse at one point and you head out on another for hire horse that's part of this larger post system. This is that kind of thing. He just sends for a, a chaise. It's getting an Uber, basically. And you will hear Mr. Weston use the phrase coxcomb. I love the word coxcomb. It's just another word for somebody who's a dandy. Like a rooster has a coxcomb and is always, you know, strutting around, being all that and a slice of bread and showing it off. So a guy who's a coxcomb, it's the same kind of an idea. He's showing off. He's kind of vain. He's preening. It's just, it's a little much. And it's a teasing word, the way it's being used in our chapters today. In our second chapter today, we get into hard and heavy into the class stuff. And it can be a little hard to track because there's a lot that we are expected to intuit about the way society structures invitations. For example, the way Emma talks about the Martins, and especially now when she's like, if they were just a little bit higher in society, it wouldn't be so bad for her. It's obviously not bad for anybody else. It's just Emma that has a problem. Emma's going to continue to just have Emma problems in our second chapter today. But listen to how frustrated she gets with the restrictions that this view, this point of view, this lookout puts on her. You watch her change her position a bit for the most, I don't want to say selfish, but self-involved reasons, which just kind of made me smile because I can absolutely hear people I've known in my life and probably even myself at some point totally thinking this way and working around to where she eventually gets to. There's a reference to a family of low origin. They're in trade and only moderately genteel, which means they've got some of the refinements that would be expected if you were going to be in the gentleman's class, but not really just kind of, they're not horribly showy and show offy, but they're also not really all the way up to snuff yet. There's going to be a reference to a house in town. This is actually a reference to a, the business in London, a house in town, the business house. 
and town being London. That because because things had been good in business, they were able to increase their means and therefore their respectability in Highbury. With their wealth, their views increased. This would be their views to being ambitious socially increased. If you watched any of um, at least the first season of The Gilded Age, I don't even know if it's still on, the up-and-coming family, her view had increased. Her social ambitions had increased with the amount of money in their bank account. Malt liquor. A reference to malt liquor. This is any beer or ale. That's all. And Piquet, P-I-Q-U-E-T, was a card game. They think it started in around 15th century France. And it's just a simple two-handed card game. That's all. And I think that's it. That is everything you need to know. So we are now going to listen to chapters 24 and 25 of Emma. That's volume two, chapters six and seven of Emma by Jane Austen. If you are listening to your own version of Emma, please fast wind to 49 minutes, 47 seconds. All right, here we go. Volume two, chapter six. The next morning brought Mr. Frank Churchill again. He came with Mrs. Weston, to whom and to Highbury he seemed to take very cordially. He had been sitting with her, it appeared, most companionably at home, till her usual hour of exercise, and on being desired to choose their walk, immediately fixed on Highbury. He did not doubt there being very pleasant walks in every direction, but if left to him he should always choose the same. Highbury, that airy, cheerful, happy-looking Highbury, would be his constant attraction. Highbury, with Mrs. Weston, stood for Hartfield, and she trusted to its bearing the same construction with him. They walked thither directly. Emma had hardly expected them, for Mr. Weston, who had called in for half a minute, in order to hear that his son was very handsome, knew nothing of their plans, and it was an agreeable surprise to her, therefore, to perceive them walking up to the house together, arm in arm. She was wanting to see him again, and especially to see him in company with Mrs. Weston, upon his behaviour to whom her opinion of him was to depend. If he were deficient there, nothing should make amends for it. But on seeing them together, she became perfectly satisfied. It was not merely in fine words or hyperbolical compliment that he paid his duty. Nothing could be more proper or pleasing than his whole manner to her. Nothing could more agreeably denote his wish of considering her as a friend and securing her affection— and there was time enough for Emma to form a reasonable judgment, as their visit included all the rest of the morning. They were all three walking about together for an hour or two, first round the shrubberies of Hartfield, and afterwards in Highbury. He was delighted with everything, admired Hartfield sufficiently for Mr. Woodhouse's ear, and when their going farther was resolved on, confessed his wish to be made acquainted with the whole village, and found matter of commendation and interest much oftener than Emma could have supposed. Some of the objects of his curiosity spoke very amiable feelings. He begged to be shown the house which his father had lived in so long, and which had been the home of his father's father, and on recollecting that an old woman who had nursed him was still living, walked in quest of her cottage from one end of the street to the other, and though in some points of pursuit or observation there was no positive merit, they showed altogether a good will towards Highbury in general, which must be very like a merit to those he was with. Emma watched and decided that with such feelings as were now shown, it could not be fairly supposed that he had ever been voluntarily absenting himself, that he had not been acting a part, or making a parade of insincere professions, and that Mr. Knightley certainly had not done him justice. Their first pause was at the Crown Inn, an inconsiderable house, though the principal one of the sort, where a couple of pair of post-horses were kept, more for the convenience of the neighbourhood than from any run on the road— and his companions had not expected to be detained by any interest excited there, but in passing it they gave the history of the large room visibly added. It had been built many years ago for a ballroom, and while the neighbourhood had been in particularly populous, dancing state, had been occasionally used as such. But such brilliant days had long passed away, and now the highest purpose for which it was ever wanted was to accommodate a whist-club established among the gentlemen and half-gentlemen of the place. He was immediately interested— its character as a ballroom caught him, and instead of passing on, he stopped for several minutes at the two superior sashed windows which were open, to look in and contemplate its capabilities, and lament that its original purpose should have ceased. He saw no fault in the room, 
He would acknowledge none which they suggested. No, it was long enough, broad enough, handsome enough. It would hold the very number for comfort. They ought to have balls there at least every fortnight through the winter. Why had not Miss Woodhouse revived the former good old days of the room? She who could do anything in Highbury. The want of proper families in the place, and the conviction that none beyond the place in its immediate environs could be tempted to attend, were mentioned, but he was not satisfied. He could not be persuaded that so many good-looking houses as he saw all around them could not furnish numbers enough for such a meeting, and even when particulars were given and families described, he was still unwilling to admit that the inconvenience of such a mixture would be anything, or that there would be the smallest difficulty in everybody's returning to their proper place the next morning. He argued like a young man very much bent on dancing, and Emma was rather surprised to see the constitution of the Weston prevail so decidedly against the habits of the Churchills. He seemed to have all the life and spirit, cheerful feelings, and social inclinations of his father, and nothing of the pride or reserve of Enscombe. Of pride, indeed, there was perhaps scarcely enough. His indifference to a confusion of rank bordered too much on inelegance of mind. He could be no judge, however, of the evil he was holding cheap. It was but an effusion of lively spirits. At last he was persuaded to move on from the front of the crown, and being now almost facing the house where the Bateses lodged, Emma recollected his intended visit the day before, and asked him if he had paid it. "'Yes, oh, yes,' he replied. "'I was just going to mention it. A very successful visit. I saw all the three ladies, and felt very much obliged to you for your preparatory hint. If the talking aunt had taken me quite by surprise, it must have been the death of me. As it was, I was only betrayed into paying a most unreasonable visit. Ten minutes would have been all that was necessary, perhaps all that was proper, and I had told my father I should certainly be home before him. But there was no getting away, no pause, and to my utter astonishment I found when he, finding me nowhere else, joined me there at last, that I had actually been sitting with them very nearly three-quarters of an hour. The good lady had not given me the possibility of escape before. "'And how did you think Miss Fairfax looking?' "'Ill, very ill.' That is, if a young lady can ever be allowed to look ill. But the expression is hardly admissible, Mrs. Weston, is it? Ladies can never look ill. And seriously, Miss Fairfax is naturally so pale as almost always to give the appearance of ill-health, a most deplorable want of complexion. Emma would not agree to this, and began a warm defence of Miss Fairfax's complexion. It was certainly never brilliant, but she would not allow it to have a sickly hue in general— and there was a softness and delicacy in her skin, which gave peculiar elegance to the character of her face. He listened with all due deference, acknowledged that he had heard many people say the same, but yet he must confess that to him nothing could make amends for the want of the fine glow of health. Where features were indifferent, a fine complexion gave beauty to them all, and where they were good, the effect was—fortunately, he need not attempt to describe what the effect was. "'Well,' said Emma, there is no disputing about taste. At least you admire her, except her complexion. He shook his head and laughed. I cannot separate Miss Fairfax and her complexion. Did you see her often at Weymouth? Were you often in the same society? At this moment they were approaching Ford's, and he hastily exclaimed, Ha! This must be the very shop that everybody attends every day of their lives, as my father informs me. He comes to Highbury himself, he says, six days out of the seven, and has always business at Ford's. If it be not inconvenient to you, pray let us go in, that I may prove myself to belong to the place, to be a true citizen of Highbury. I must buy something at Ford's. It will be taking out my freedom. I dare say they sell gloves. Oh, yes, gloves and everything. I do admire your patriotism. You will be adored in Highbury. You were very popular before you came, because you were Mr. Weston's son. But lay out half a guinea at Ford's, and your popularity will stand upon your own virtues. They went in, and while the sleek, well-tied parcels of men's beavers and York tan were bringing down and displaying on the counter, he said, "'But I beg your pardon, Miss Woodhouse. You were speaking to me. You were saying something at the very moment of this burst of my amour patrie. Do not let me lose it. I assure you the utmost stretch of public fame would not make me amends for the loss of any happiness in private life. I merely asked whether you had known much of Miss Fairfax and her party at Weymouth. And now that I understand your question, I must pronounce it to be a very unfair one. 
It is always the lady's right to decide on the degree of acquaintance. Miss Fairfax must have already given her account. I shall not commit myself by claiming more than she may choose to allow. Upon my word, you answer as discreetly as she could do herself. But her account of everything leaves so much to be guessed. She is so very reserved, so very unwilling to give the least information about anybody, that I really think you may say what you like of your acquaintance with her. May I indeed? Then I will speak the truth, and nothing suits me so well. I met her frequently at Weymouth. I had known the Campbells a little in town, and at Weymouth we were very much in the same set. Colonel Campbell is a very agreeable man, and Mrs. Campbell a friendly, warm-hearted woman. I like them all. You know Miss Fairfax's situation in life, I conclude, what she is destined to be. Yes, rather hesitatingly, I believe I do. You get upon delicate subjects, Emma, said Mrs. Weston, smiling. Remember that I am here. Mr. Frank Churchill hardly knows what to say when you speak of Miss Fairfax's situation in life. I will move a little farther off. I certainly do forget to think of her, said Emma. "'as having ever been but anything but my friend and my dearest friend.' "'He looked as if he fully understood and honoured such a sentiment. "'When the gloves were bought, and they had quitted the shop again, "'Did you ever hear the young lady we were speaking of play?' said Frank Churchill. "'Ever hear her?' repeated Emma. "'You forget how much she belongs to Highbury. "'I have heard her every year of our lives since we both began. "'She plays charmingly.' "'You think so, do you?' I wanted the opinion of some one who could really judge. She appeared to me to play well, that is, with considerable taste, but I know nothing of the matter myself. I am excessively fond of music, but without the smallest skill or right of judging of anybody's performance. I have been used to hear hers admired, and I remember one proof of her being thought to play well. A man, a very musical man, and in love with another woman, engaged to her, on the point of marriage— would yet never ask that other woman to sit down to the instrument, if the lady in question could sit down instead, never seemed to like to hear one if he could hear the other. That, I thought, in a man of known musical talent, was some proof. "'Proof, indeed,' said Emma, highly amused. "'Mr. Dixon is very musical, is he? We shall know more about them all in half an hour, from you, than Miss Fairfax would have vouchsafed in half a year.' Yes, Mr. Dixon and Miss Campbell were the persons, and I thought it a very strong proof. Certainly, very strong it was. To own the truth a great deal stronger than, if I had been Miss Campbell, would have been at all agreeable to me. I could not excuse a man's having more music than love, more ear than I, a more acute sensibility to fine sounds than to my feelings. How did Miss Campbell appear to like it? "'It was a very particular friend, you know.' "'Poor comfort,' said Emma, laughing. "'One would rather have a stranger preferred than one's very particular friend. "'With a stranger it might not occur again, "'but the misery of having a very particular friend always at hand "'to do everything better than one does oneself. "'Poor Mrs. Dixon. "'Well, I am glad she has gone to settle in Ireland.' "'You are right. "'It was not very flattering to Miss Campbell.' but really she did not seem to feel it. And so much the better, or so much the worse, I do not know which. But be it sweetness or be it stupidity in her, quickness of friendship or dullness of feeling, there was one person, I think, who must have felt it, Miss Fairfax herself. She must have felt the improper and dangerous distinction. As to that, I do not— "'Oh, do not imagine that I expect an account of Miss Fairfax's sensations from you, or from anybody else. They are known to no human being, I guess, but herself. But if she continued to play whenever she was asked by Mr. Dixon, one may guess what one chooses.' "'There appeared such a perfectly good understanding among them all,' he began rather quickly, but checking himself added, "'However, it is impossible for me to say on what terms they really were, how it might be all behind the scenes.' I can only say that there was smoothness outwardly. But you, who have known Miss Fairfax from a child, must be a better judge of her character, and of how she is likely to conduct herself in critical situations than I can be. I have known her from a child, undoubtedly. We have been children and women together, and it is natural to suppose that we should be intimate, that we should have taken to each other whenever she visited her friends. But we never did. 
I hardly know how it has happened, a little perhaps from that wickedness on my side, which was prone to take disgust towards a girl so idolized and so cried up as she always was, by her aunt and grandmother, and all their set. And then her reserve! I never could attach myself to any one so completely reserved. It is a most repulsive quality indeed, said he, oftentimes very convenient, no doubt, but never pleasing. There is safety in reserve, but no attraction. One cannot love a reserved person. Not till the reserve ceases towards oneself, and then the attraction may be the greater. But I must be more in want of a friend, or an agreeable companion, than I have yet been, to take the trouble of conquering anybody's reserve to procure one. Intimacy between Miss Fairfax and me is quite out of the question. I have no reason to think ill of her, not the least— except that such extreme and perpetual cautiousness of word and manner, such a dread of giving a distinct idea about anybody, is apt to suggest of there being something to conceal. He perfectly agreed with her, and after walking together so long and thinking so much alike, Emma felt herself so well acquainted with him that she could hardly believe it to be only their second meeting. He was not exactly what she had expected— less of the man of the world in some of his notions, less of the spoiled child of fortune, therefore better than she had expected. His ideas seemed more moderate, his feelings warmer. She was particularly struck by his manner of considering Mr. Elton's house, which, as well as the church, he would go and look at, and would not join them in finding much fault with. No, he could not believe it a bad house, not such a house as a man was to be pitied for having— if it were to be shared with the woman he loved, he could not think any man to be pitied for having that house. There must be ample room in it for every real comfort. The man must be a blockhead who wanted more. Mrs. Weston laughed and said he did not know what he was talking about. Used only to a large house himself, and without ever thinking how many advantages and accommodations were attached to its size, he could be no judge of the privations inevitably belonging to a small one. But Emma, in her own mind, determined that he did know what he was talking about, and that he showed a very amiable inclination to settle early in life, and to marry, from worthy motives. He might not be aware of the inroads on domestic peace to be occasioned by no housekeeper's room, or a bad butler's pantry, but no doubt he did perfectly feel that Enscombe could not make him happy, and that whenever he were attached, he would willingly give up much of wealth to be allowed an early establishment. End of chapter 6 Volume 2, Chapter 7 Emma's very good opinion of Frank Churchill was a little shaken the following day by hearing that he was gone off to London, merely to have his hair cut. A sudden freak seemed to have seized him at breakfast, and he had sent for a chaise and set off, intending to return to dinner, but with no more important view that appeared than having his hair cut. There was certainly no harm in his travelling sixteen miles twice over on such an errand, but there was an air of foppery and nonsense in it which he could not approve. It did not accord with the rationality of plan, the moderation in expense, or even the unselfish warmth of heart which she had believed herself to discern in him yesterday. Vanity, extravagance, love of change, restlessness of temper, which must be doing something, good or bad, heedlessness as to the pleasure of his father and Mrs. Weston, indifferent as to how his conduct might appear in general, he became liable to all these charges. His father only called him a coxcomb, and thought it a very good story, but that Mrs. Weston did not like it was clear enough, by her passing it over as quickly as possible, and making no other comment than that— all young people would have their little whims. With the exception of this little blot, Emma found that his visit hitherto had given her friend only good ideas of him. Mrs. Weston was very ready to say how attentive and pleasant a companion he made himself, how much she saw to like in his disposition altogether. He appeared to have a very open temper, certainly a very cheerful and lively one. She could observe nothing wrong in his notions, a great deal decidedly right. He spoke of his uncle with warm regard, was fond of talking to him, said that he would be the best man in the world if he were left to himself, and though there was no being attached to the aunt, he acknowledged her kindness with gratitude, and seemed to mean always to speak of her with respect. This was all very promising." and, but for such an unfortunate fancy for his having his hair cut, there was nothing to denote him unworthy of the distinguished honour which her imagination had given him, the honour, if not of being really in love with her, of being at least very near it, and saved only by her own indifference, 
for still her resolution held of never marrying, the honour, in short, of being marked out for her by all their joint acquaintance. Mr. Weston, on his side, added a virtue to the account which must have some weight. He gave her to understand that Frank admired her extremely, thought her very beautiful and very charming, and with so much to be said for him altogether, she found she must not judge him harshly. As Mrs. Weston observed, "'All young people would have their little whims.' There was one person among his new acquaintance in Surrey not so leniently disposed. In general he was judged, throughout the parishes of Donwell and Highbury, with great candour. Liberal allowances were made for the little excesses of such a handsome young man, one who smiled so often and bowed so well. But there was one spirit among them not to be softened, from its power of censure, by bows or smiles. Mr. Knightley. The circumstance was told him at Hartfield. For the moment he was silent— but Emma heard him almost immediately afterwards say to himself, over a newspaper he held in his hand, "'Hm! Just the trifling, silly fellow I took him for.' She had half a mind to resent, but an instant's observation convinced her that it was really said only to relieve his own feelings, and not meant to provoke, and therefore she let it pass. Although in one instance the bearers of not good tidings, Mr. and Mrs. Weston's visit this morning was in another respect particularly opportune— Something occurred while they were at Hartfield, to make Emma want their advice, and which was still more lucky, she wanted exactly the advice they gave. This was the occurrence. The Coles had been settled some years in Highbury, and were a very good sort of people, friendly, liberal, and unpretending, but on the other hand they were of low origin, in trade, and only moderately genteel. On their first coming into the country, they had lived in proportion to their income, quietly, keeping little company, and that little unexpensively. But the last year or two had brought them a considerable increase of means, the house in town had yielded greater profits, and fortune in general had smiled on them. With their wealth, their views increased, their want of a larger house, their inclination for more company— they added to their house, to their number of servants, to their expenses of every sort, and by this time were, in fortune and style of living, second only to the family at Hartfield. Their love of society, and their new dining-room, prepared everybody for their keeping dinner company, and a few parties, chiefly among the single men, had already taken place. The regular and best families Emma could hardly suppose they would presume to invite, neither Donwell nor Hartfield nor Randalls. Nothing should tempt her to go if they did, and she regretted that her father's known habits would be giving her refusal less meaning than she could wish. The Coles were very respectable in their way, but they ought to be taught that it was not for them to arrange the terms on which the superior families would visit them. This lesson, she very much feared, they would receive only from herself. She had little hope of Mr. Knightley none of Mr. Weston. But she had made up her mind how to meet this presumption so many weeks before it appeared, that when the insult came at last, it found her very differently affected. Donwell and Randalls had received their invitation, and none had come for her father and herself, and Mrs. Weston's accounting for it with, "'I suppose they will not take the liberty with you. They know you do not dine out,' was not quite sufficient. She felt that she should like to have had the power of refusal— and afterwards, as the idea of the party to be assembled there, consisting precisely of those whose society was dearest to her, occurred again and again, she did not know that she might not have been tempted to accept. Harriet was to be there in the evening, and the Bateses. They had been speaking of it as they walked about Highbury the day before, and Frank Churchill most earnestly lamented her absence. Might not the evening end in a dance? had been a question of his. The bare possibility of it acted as a farther irritation on her spirits, and her being left in solitary grandeur, even supposing the omission be intended as a compliment, was but poor comfort. It was the arrival of this very invitation while the Westons were at Hartfield, which made their presence so acceptable, for though her first remark, on reading it, was that, "'Of course it must be declined,' she so very soon proceeded to ask them what they advised her to do, that their advice for her going was most prompt and successful. She owned that, considering everything, she was not absolutely without inclination for the party. The Coles expressed themselves so properly, there was so much real attention in the manner of it, so much consideration for her father. They would have solicited the honour earlier, but had been waiting upon the arrival of a folding screen from London, which they hoped might keep Mr. Woodhouse from any draught of air, and therefore induce him the more readily to give them the honour of his company. 
Upon the whole she was very persuadable, and it being briefly settled among themselves how it might be done without neglecting his comfort, how certainly Mrs. Goddard, if not Mrs. Bates, might be depended on for bearing him company, Mr. Woodhouse was to be talked into an acquiescence of his daughter's going out to dinner, on a day now near at hand, and spending the whole evening away from him. As for his going, Emma did not wish him to think it possible. The hours would be too late, and the party too numerous. He was soon pretty well resigned. "'I am not fond of dinner-visiting,' said he. "'I never was. No more is Emma. Late hours do not agree with us. I am sorry Mr. and Mrs. Cole should have done it. I think it would be much better if they would come in one afternoon next summer, and take their tea with us, take us in their afternoon walk.' which they might do, as our hours are so reasonable, and yet get home without being out in the damp of the evening. The dews of a summer evening are what I would not expose anybody to. However, as they are so very desirous to have dear Emma dine with them, and as you will both be there, and Mr. Knightley too, to take care of her, I cannot wish to prevent it, provided the weather be what it ought, neither damp nor cold nor windy. Then, turning to Mrs. Weston with a look of gentle reproach, "'Ah, oh, Miss Taylor, if you had not married, you would have stayed at home with me.' "'Well, sir,' cried Mr. Weston, "'as I took Miss Taylor away, it is incumbent on me to supply her place if I can, and I will step to Mrs. Goddard's in a moment if you wish it.' But the idea of anything to be done in a moment was increasing, not lessening Mr. Woodhouse's agitation. The ladies knew better how to allay it. Mr. Weston must be quiet, and everything deliberately arranged." With this treatment Mr. Woodhouse was soon composed enough for talking as usual. He should be happy to see Mrs. Goddard. He had a great regard for Mrs. Goddard, and Emma should write a line and invite her. James could take the note. But first of all there must be an answer written to Mrs. Cole. "'You will make excuses, my dear, as civilly as possible. You will say that I am quite an invalid, and go nowhere, and therefore must decline their obliging invitation, beginning with my compliments, of course. But you will do everything right. I need not tell you what is to be done. We must remember to let James know that the carriage will be wanted on Tuesday. I shall have no fears for you with him. We have never been there above once since the new approach was made, but still I have no doubt that James will take you very safely, and when you get there you must tell him at what time you would have him come for you again, and you had better name an early hour. You will not like staying late. You will get very tired when tea is over. But you would not wish me to come away before I am tired, papa. "'Oh, no, my love, but you will soon be tired. There will be a great many people talking at once. You will not like the noise.' "'But, my dear sir,' cried Mr. Weston, "'if Emma comes away too early, it will be breaking up the party.' "'And no great harm if it does,' said Mr. Woodhouse. "'The sooner every party breaks up, the better.' "'But you do not consider how it may appear to the coals. Emma's going away directly after tea might be giving offence. They are good-natured people, and think little of their own claims, but still they must feel that anybody's hurrying away is no great compliment, and Miss Woodhouse's doing it would be more thought of than any other person's in the room. He would not wish to disappoint and mortify the coals, I am sure, sir, friendly, good sort of people as ever lived, and who have been your neighbours these ten years. Oh, no, upon no account in the world, Mr. Weston, I am much obliged to you for reminding me. I should be extremely sorry to be giving them any pain. I know what worthy people they are. Perry tells me that Mr. Cole never touches malt liquor. You would not think it to look at him, but he is bilious. Mr. Cole is very bilious. No, I would not be the means of giving them any pain. My dear Emma, we must consider this. I am sure, rather than run the risk of hurting Mr. and Mrs. Cole, you would stay a little longer than you might wish. You will not regard being tired. You will be perfectly safe, you know, among your friends. Oh, yes, papa. I have no fears at all for myself, and I should have no scruples of staying as late as Mrs. Weston, but on your account. I am only afraid of your sitting up for me. I am not afraid of your being extremely comfortable with Mrs. Goddard. She loves piquet, you know. But when she has gone home, I am afraid you'll be sitting up by yourself, instead of going to bed at your usual time, and the idea of that would entirely destroy my comfort. You must promise me not to sit up. He did, on the condition of some promises on her side, such as that, if she came home cold, she would be sure to warm herself thoroughly, if hungry, that she would take something to eat, 
that her own maid should sit up for her, and that Searle and the butler should see that everything were safe in the house, as usual. End of chapter 7 So one of the things that I loved learning in our first chapter today, chapter 24, was how much Highbury seems to have changed. Highbury used to have an inn that allowed for quite a bit of post traffic, and that there were there were horses always to be gotten there, but such brilliant days had long passed away. So that's interesting that Highbury has undergone some kind of a change in structure, in money, in society, which kind of makes me think that it's one of the reasons why Emma's views of societal restrictions don't seem to match anybody else in town. I mean, she certainly got, you know, more money than you could shake a stick at, but she does seem to, especially when you start to look at how she deals with coals, she does seem to be kind of alone in her attitudes. I also loved that Jane Austen, through Emma, makes it clear to us that Frank has all the life and spirit and cheerful feelings of his father and none of the pride or reserve of the Churchills, of the people at Enscombe. I also think it's important that M is cluing us in on his indifference to a confusion of rank bordered too much on inelegance of mind. But, you know, he's, he's okay about that. Again, just another sign that Emma actually may be hopelessly behind the times when it comes to questions of class in her own society. The world is changing. And her father, although clearly a very open-minded person when it comes to questions of class, wouldn't have been a real force for awareness of that change since he doesn't do much out in the world. And everybody knows it, as we see in our second chapter today. There are a couple of places where I just loved Mrs. Weston in these two chapters. One, when Emma and Mrs. Weston and Frank are walking through Highbury and the, the conversation starts to turn to Jane. Emma starts having more or less an open and honest conversation with Frank. And Mrs. Weston's like, I think he can't answer you appropriately because I am still here. So I'm going to go over there. So you two kids can have your little gossip fest about Jane without worrying that you are going to offend me or make me raise my eyebrow. I thought, that's nice. That's a sly move on Mrs. Weston's part. First off, letting them know that she knows. Like, I, I know you probably shouldn't be talking about this, but I'm not going to make it any worse by staying around here. I'm going to go. I thought that was lovely. Then when Frank starts asking questions about whether Jane Fairfax has played the piano for Emma and brings up without using names, somebody who was very musical, who always wanted Jane to play instead of his intended, his fiance, which was the Campbell's daughter who marries Mr. Dixon. Emma does not hear this was proof of Jane's excellent playing. She hears, oh, Mr. Dixon was asking for Jane to do something for him. Eh, what? Emma immediately goes there. So she has not let go of that bone. This is a dog that will not let go of a bone for a while yet. I also like that Emma said, Miss Campbell's, now Mrs. Dixon's, unrecognition of the fact that her husband to be at the time was preferring Jane Fairfax's playing to her own. Frank's like, I don't think she felt it at all. It was not a big deal. And Emma's response, so much the better than an M dash. Or so much the worse, another M dash. I do not know which. She's right. I had exactly the same reaction. It's like, oh, that could be either good, the way that Isabella's relationship with Mr. John Knightley is like, she doesn't hear any of the possible slights and kind of makes you uncomfortable, but she's also very happy. And so is he. So it's even odds as to whether that would be a good thing or not. I also loved Emma's, I drew a scary face in my, the margins of my book when Emma said, but if she continued to play whenever she was asked by Mr. Dixon, one may guess what one chooses. It's like, dun, 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 dun. Oh, Emma. Then in chapter 25, here's my other point where I just love Mrs. Weston. So Frank goes to town and is getting his hair cut. I mean, what? What? Really? Okay. That's like a day's journey there and back for a haircut. 
wow, okay. And then instead of her participating in any kind of gossip about that, Mrs. Weston says, well, all young people would have their little whims. And then when talking about Mr. Weston's thinking that maybe Frank liked Emma, again, she's like, well, all young people must have their little whims. I think I'm going to start saying that to my own kids, or maybe just saying it in my head when they are talking about things that they're doing. Uh, then there was a beautifully snarky, God, I love her, Jane Austen moment, where Emma's wrestling with this problem of what to do about the Coles, and the Coles are going to have these parties. They have reached, they've attained a certain level of society within Highbury, and now it's going to get uncomfortable because Emma is too high up in the scale to easily go to anything that she's invited to, and in fact is going to have to put the Coles into their place by saying, really, you can't, you can't just be inviting me. I'm not your everyday attendee. But then also liking the fact that she's not getting invited. But my favorite Jane Austen part was when the Westons came over and Emma's like, oh, thank goodness, I can ask you about this. And not only ask you about this, but in retrospect, she says, not only ask, but still more lucky, she liked the answer that they gave her. She's like, oh, thank God. Here you can help me make this decision. And oh, thank God, even more because you agree with me. That's just awesome. I was a little surprised to find out eventually that the Coles had been there in town for 10 years. And within that 10 years, the business started making enough money that the Coles were able to rise in society. But that also means that they were not unknown quantities for 10 years. And Emma definitely has had some kind of interaction with them at some point. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And Emma's upset because everybody knows that her dad was, doesn't want to go out to dinner. And so they're not going to invite her, according to Mrs. Weston. And I was like, yeah, but that, that kind of sucks because now I don't get to teach them their lesson about where they are at in society and where I am at, which is just such a snotty thing to say on Emma's part. But Jane Austen follows that up with showing what that kind of attitude can do for you. You wind up being alone and lonely a lot more often if you insist about the ivory tower that you are living within being impermeable to any changes in society. And I thought Austin's, the excuse that her father wouldn't go out to eat was not quite sufficient for Emma. It didn't give her that opportunity to do the social interaction training that she felt she needed to do. But then everybody else is getting to go, including Harriet and the Westons and everyone. And she's like, well, I might have been tempted to accept under these circumstances that everybody else is getting to go. I also loved the phrase solitary grandeur, that she's being left in solitary grandeur. That's just beautiful writing. I love that. Then, you know, by the next paragraph, the Coles have expressed themselves so beautifully in writing the way that they have invited her. And they made sure that everybody understood they hadn't invited Emma and her father because they were waiting for a folding screen to come in from London before they in invited her father, knowing how upset he was by drafts and things like that, which is, even if it's BS, it's a lovely way to point out that this is a family that's paying attention and paying attention not just to kind of who's wearing what and do we have a chocolate pot as well as a coffee pot and a teapot but or a chocolate service as well as a coffee service and a tea service but it's also the next level up from that the caring not about what people think but wanting them to feel good and welcome and having a good time able to have a good time and i thought that was an important piece, I think, to us understanding the Coles a little bit more, at least at this point in the story. And I can't help but wonder if Mrs. Weston hadn't said something to the Coles to get them to finally invite Emma. And because this has been going on for some time now, there have been other parties that Emma hasn't been able to go to. When they finally do invite her in this lovely way, she decides she's going to go. And then it becomes all about her dad. Oh. Mr. Woodhouse, oh, the sooner every party breaks up, the better. <laughs> He's just, ah, oh, I love him. He drives me crazy, but I love him. But I would totally want to wring his neck in real life. And Emma is such a good daughter. 
don't worry, Papa, we're not going to say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. But the important thing is you have to promise me that you're not going to stay up late waiting for me because that's not going to do you any good either. So uh, 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 they just have a really interesting, comforting, not just comfortable, comforting relationship between the two of them, which is just lovely. He's not Mr. Fairley in The Woman in White, but he's also not Mr. Bennett. He is a horse of a different color. He is really his own person, and I really do enjoy him a lot. He can drive me nuts, but I love him a lot. I also like the fact that Mr. Weston points out that they are good-natured people and think little of their own claims. They don't really think a lot about the fact that they are or aren't allowed to invite certain people. They want to make sure everybody has a good time. They want to enjoy what they've got with people that they like. And because of that, anybody leaving early would hurt them because it would indicate that they had somehow not provided that level of comfort that they were, that they were looking to. And I do like the fact that for Mr. Woodhouse, that actually matters that, oh, well, we don't want, we don't want them to be upset. We don't want to hurt their feelings. We just want to make sure that Emma isn't out too late because that'll get her tired, Read, And that'll make me tired because I'll be staying up waiting for her to come home. But I also love, well, you know, Mr. Perry says Mr. Coles does not touch malt liquor. So I guess it's an okay place for you to go hang, Emma. And you are going to have all of your friends with you. And yeah, it's also funny how Mr. Weston's like, I'm on it. I'll go get Mrs. Goddard. I'll go get her to agree to do this right now. And then we can all be settled and everything will be great. And Mr. Woodhouse, you'll be fine. And they're, Emma and Mrs. Weston are like, no, slow down going to take his brain a little longer to get to the point that you're already jumping to. So give us some time to convince Papa Woodhouse that this is going to be okay. You know, it's the thing with families, right? Like everybody ultimately, if things work well, learns how to communicate with the different people in their family because everyone has quirky family members. Everyone is probably a quirky family member in our own ways. And learning how not to upset the apple cart is so important. And getting a chance to watch what apple carts get set up and also how they get sidestepped in this book has been really, really interesting. Heather from the Editing Future here. I wanted to share a voicemail that just came in from listener Carrie about the uh, amounts of time that people spend visiting one another and and Cranford, which we haven't done on Craftlet yet, but which is definitely on the list. Here's Carrie. Hello, my name is Carrie, and I've been enjoying Emma. And there's been some conversation, and the writing has been about the link um, and what would be the proper length of an appropriate visit. And this is tickling in my mind, and I remember why. And it's because it, this, this is specifically addressed in Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. And um, I think the book takes place about the same time as Emma, but um, maybe what's more important to know is that in Cranford, the women there have their own way of doing things. And the narrator points out in a loving way that the way that they do things might be a little bit dated. Anyways, here's an excerpt from Cranford that um, hopefully uh, people will find uh, humorous and enjoyable. I dare say your mama has told you, my dear, never to let more than three days elapse between receiving a call and returning it, and also that you are never to stay longer than a quarter of an, an hour. But Am I to look at my watch? How am I to find out when a quarter of an hour has passed? You must keep thinking about the time, my dear, and not allow yourself to forget it in conversation. Anyways, I just found that amusing. Hopefully you do too. Um, times change, different expectations, whatnot, but I just uh, hope you enjoy. Thank you. Bye for now. So huge thanks to Carrie for sending that in, and thank you for reading the quotation the the selection from Cranford it's it's definitely been on my list for a while and now I'm even more intrigued so thank you 
that's about it. I have one other question for all y'all who are into fiber arts. And it is this. I needed to make some crochet things for my sister. And I went to my crochet basket and I found all of my old crochet yarn, the cotton yarn, like for amigurumis and stuff. And I have a dumpster load of sugar and cream yarn, which I have never liked. It's all splitty and nasty and gross. There used to be Lion Brand Cotton Ease, which was part cotton, part cotton, part wool, part cotton, part palamide. I don't remember, but it was part cotton, part something else that made it not splitty. And it's no longer being made. I was able to get a couple of stains of cotton ease off of eBay, but only in very limited colors, not surprisingly. And I tried to look on Ravelry. I tried to look online. What has replaced cotton ease? What options do we have? And the answer is bupkis, as far as I could tell. Other people had asked the same question, but nobody seemed to have a decent answer. And I can't believe that. I can't believe that somebody isn't making a decent non-splitty cotton yarn. So if you know of one, please let me know. And I'll share that with, with everybody else. You can let me know, you know, on Facebook or in the comments, or you can email heather at craftlet.com or 206-350-1642 and let us know what's better than sugar and cream cotton yarn. And with that, I leave you. Have a great one. I will talk to you next week. Take care. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash craftlet channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlet lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. makers and readers, and people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right, you take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.